The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. IntelliFlow is on a mission to give more people access to financial advice. Their technology, IntelliFlow Office, powers and streamlines the advisory experience for over 30,000 financial advisors worldwide, making an impact at every stage of the advice process, including practice management, revenue management, cash flow modelling, client portals and more. IntelliFlow Office helps advisors manage all their client and provider data within a single integrated ecosystem that just works. Discover IntelliFlow for yourself by visiting IntelliFlow.com. Hello, welcome back to another episode. I'm James Wrigley and I have the pleasure of speaking with Bruce Madden. Bruce runs a business called Madden and Associates, kind of PR, communications, that kind of thing. I'll get Bruce to explain what he's up to. But as I was just saying before we pressed record, we should have pressed record as soon as we started this because I think there's been a bit of, <laughs> a bit of good chat we've had already. Anyway, Bruce, thank you for, for joining me this afternoon to, to have thank you. you. Thank you, James. And uh, yeah, I agree. It's lovely to talk to you and uh, I think the, the concept of quality financial advice and the growth of the ensemble idea and this this collective notion of advisors coming together to help themselves, I really love that. So it's a pleasure to be here and I hope I can add some value to the listeners. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for joining us. So we're going to tackle this kind of idea of advice reputation or advisor reputation and we'll come at it from a few different angles. Um, but that'll be that'll kind of be the gist of the the, the podcast. Um, and maybe if we start off with a, I, know, I think it may be a tricky question to answer. You might not think the case, but but this idea of advice reputation is there a difference between advice reputation from a from an industry profession perspective versus an advisor reputation? So my reputation versus another advisor versus someone mm. else. Are the two different? And, ha- and ha- how are they different? Do you think? Yeah, it's a. Wonderful question. Thank you. And uh, it's an important question because uh, the two are intertwined. And uh, what we know about reputation is that your personal effort, your personal relationships, your business, your uh, results that you achieve with your customers will have a huge determinant on your personal reputation. Okay. Now, you're operating under that brand, but also essentially an umbrella brand of financial advice. So, uh, you know, that it's, it's the old adage really, and I do a lot of work in helping organizations in the financial services space with their reputation as it relates to managing media and their public face, so how they're represented through media. And I, I look back over the last 30-odd years of doing this uh, as a journalist and also in the last 20 years as, um, as an, an, an advisor and a PR person, a strategic communications person, really. And I'd say, well, you know, there are so many great advisors who have a fantastic reputation, who do excellent work, who have been tarred with the brush of the reputation of what was um, financial advice but misconstrued financial advice. Yep. So that... That's really interesting to me, James, because uh, I, I remember standing up one time at a Financial Planning Association Congress. It was in the mid-2000s, and I was talking exactly on this subject in that time. So, that's 2007, in fact, just before uh, the global financial crisis, before the world got a bit crazy. So, I got up, and there was maybe 2,000 people in the room, and I talked about the movie... 300 starring Gerard Butler and I likened that movie which was a story of some 300 brave Spartans who fought off the might of the Persian armies and those 300 were in my narrative the financial advisors suffering the slings and arrows of the regulators, the consumer lobby, the media and other 
protagonists who were seeking to attack them on the basis of their perceived weaknesses as uh, a financial advice, uh, a true and genuine financial advice offer. And I helped to promote the idea that the best way to correct your reputation, defend your reputation, build and create a positive reputation was, yes, you've got to observe all the regulatory issues, you've got to understand uh, the consumer, uh, and at that point it was mostly the industry superannuation funds that were quite vocal in attacking advice. But you have to reach deep and um, identify those things that where you actually personally make a difference in, in, in a sense, corporatize that. So corporatize that essence of quality advice. And that was all about the customer experience and the very positive value and benefits that advice brings that we all know about. And um, it was interesting because at the end of that process, because I made some comments about what is advice and what's not advice, and one of the comments was, look, if you've got over a thousand customers on your books and some people who call themselves advisors in those days actually had a book of clients that was in the 2000s and above. Yeah, right. I said, look, you know, that's not advice. <laughs> that's something else. <laughs> you know, you, you can't possibly offer advice to that many people, you know. And so I had a, at the end of that session, I had a line of people who wanted to beat me up. And they were the old school with the, the large client books. And there were those that were more interested in the the idea of their personal brand and how to fix their industry brand, if you like, or industry reputation. And those were the ones that have, you know, I thought got on and did a great job in terms of developing their independent models and um, cut loose from their licensees and started practicing actual advice, not product distribution. Gotcha. Can, can you talk yeah. a little bit about so you, you, you mentioned that, you know, attending an FBA conference and doing a presentation and, and, and so forth. Can, can you give us a little bit of a little bit of a backstory on kind of who's Bruce, what's, what's Bruce's you know, situation and how have you, you know, what are you doing now in terms of the communication? What does that actually look like? Um, yeah. And, and a bit of the work history to where you are now. Sure, sure. So, look, I'm, I'm, I, I guess I still identify as a writer and a, and a, and a journalist. That was my vocation. That's something that... I, I was always drawn to as a child, and, and I began after university in um, operating in different um, different industries. And I was drawn via a friend across to uh, the David Koch house. Uh, David, back in the day, ran a number of uh, financial publications and did a lot of consumer finance. But he had uh, money management in, uh, amongst his stable. David was one of the founding editors of Money Management, which is now thirty odd years, you know, still running it after thirty it years servicing the, the sector. Yeah. So I joined. I, I joined David at about the same time that Paul Keating uh, and the Labor government of the day, nineteen ninety two, created the superannuation guarantee system, the SG system of mandated superannuation. And interestingly enough, uh, Keating at that time uh, had the reputation for as the godfather, if you like, of financial planning. Yeah. So until that time, uh, there were agents, there were advisors that were doing interesting things within the larger institutions. But because suddenly everyday Australians had superannuation accounts to look after and uh, weren't automatically going on the, the age pension uh, that system, you know, was uh, quite revolutionary and it spawned a lot of activity from the asset management production side, so the fund managers, and then the advisors giving advice to, um, to, to customers. So I joined money management at circa uh, mid-1990s, I think, uh, just after that, the creation of the SG system. Uh, I then went on to um, do a lot of different media uh, launched some publications. I launched another um, magazine called Asset at the Fairfax uh, Group. It was part of the BRW Media organization. It went on for about 10 years until it was subsumed by the, the Financial Review, the, the AFR. Um, we're now in the early 2000s and I started in consulting. So I started uh, in, in public relations and uh, my company now, uh, Madden and Associates, we're uh, we're just one PR agency of the year. 
in 2023, which is wonderful. And uh, we, uh, we're a small, we're a boutique firm and uh, we have some financial advice organisations on our books very proudly. We've worked with a number of great financial advisory firms. We've helped launch firms. Well, there was a, a business back in the day that um, was called Centric Wealth that still exists and, and it's, uh, it's been rolled up into other other another group but I, through that process i've met a lot of great advisors who who are actually advisors not not uh, not the other form that i mentioned earlier but uh, when i think of pr and i don't know maybe it's just the news cycle when i when i think of pr it's i automatically go to oh no something bad's happened and i need someone to help me manage the the fallout from from this thing that that's happened the spin, the spin doctor yeah <laughs> Is that just what it is in the TV shows, or is that what it is in real life? <laughs> like, what, like, no, that, what, what is that, what you PR? What is it? What is it? It's a great question. So, um, and this is why I don't like the term PR because it has so much uh, ambiguity around it. Yeah. So you do get that sort of classic Hollywood the PR guy is the the spin doctor or or the person that indulges in the dark arts of spinning a client out of trouble. You know the that that sort of style but um i think from my point of view coming from a, a very um uh, a very strong journalism background and uh having had you know exposure to a whole range of different mediums and audiences and and you know obviously taking the line of the uh, transparency integrity truth those things matter so you know that's all part of um your moral compass. So for us, PR is all about uh, those things. It's it's being transparent. It's being transparent to the media that we're talking to on a daily basis, but also with the client. Importantly, it's no different to financial advice and, and, and advisors. You, as a professional services business, you you need that level of uh, mutual trust and respect and, and integrity with your clients. So that that certainly guides what we do and. In, in effect, PR is a bit of a misnomer for us. It's more that we um, are communication strategists. So we do our best work where there's reputation issues involved. Uh, some of our some of our uh, work that um, we're most proud of, you will never see in the media because it's helped avoid a crisis. It's helped to communicate well internally inside an organisation. Uh, an example might be a cyber event where there's um, – a fraud that's been committed, and were that not managed well, and uh, you know, and legally and resolved, and um, then you could have had uh, you know a, a chaotic sort of consequences on the outside in terms of public run on a super fund, for example, or, or banking that sort of thing. Gotcha. In terms of communication, so you know, obviously we're communicating now, just talking. We're all as advisors, we're communicating with our clients and. It might be staff and, and and all the rest of it. Like, do you have any do you have any tips on 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 how? <laughs> like on, on how? I'm going to say how can I be an effective communicator? But I, now, what does that even mean? But like, how, what? How can you know anyone that's listening? Can they? You know, is there is there something that they can take from this about how, how can they communicate better? But is is there something along those lines you can? Yeah, comment? it's a great question and. Uh... Um, you know, I've I've done a lot of media training actually within financial licensees, and and for the the advisors that want uh, a media profile, it's it's an important part of uh, understanding that when you're communicating, it's um, it's rarely about yourself. It's 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 about the audience that you're targeting, and particularly if you're talking via the channel of media. But I think uh, one of the things I love to raise in those sessions is to um, talk about the power of three. So Three is a magic number, and uh, if you have s- just three things that you want to convey to a client or to an audience, you'll invariably win them over and satisfy their need for information. If you give them four, that's one too many, and they've forgotten what the first one is. Gotcha. If yeah. you give them two, then you're a dill. You don't know what you sound. You don't know what you're talking about. So it, the impression is that three just resolves it, and. You know, this is founded in uh, the teachings of Aristotle. So the ancient Greeks got it right. And from from the Aristotle point of view, it's uh, three components of oration, uh, ethos, pathos, and logos. Yeah. So ethos being, you know, is it the right thing to do? Is it ethical? 
And pathos is emotion. It's the heart. And logos, logic, the head. So you've got to get the head, the heart, and you've got to do the right thing. And that's, that's simply um, how to be more effective uh, with, you know, with a client or with any audience. And, uh, and that goes way beyond just you know, f- making sure that the SOA is completed and the, the fact finds done and the due diligence is all tidied up. It's actually listening uh, with, with, um, you know, with intent and uh, hearing the client and repeating that back to them. Uh, but also utilizing those those other elements that I just talked about. Yep, I think that's yep. really important. It's pretty simple, but a lot of people let they get they let their ego or they let their um, their own stuff get in the way and uh, don't allow enough time to listen in order to you know effectively um, uh, respond to the the need or what that person is actually trying to convey to you. Yeah. And, yeah, and before we before we started recording this, you you were talking about the the power of kind of using anecdotes of you know, things that have happened to you in the past and and these kind of stories. Like, how do you bring that? Absolutely. Into- so, you know, every, everyone has an opinion, I guess, and uh, opinions, you know, are, um, are fine in terms of signalling your intent, but it's the proof, it's the proof point, it's the evidence. It's the statistical data. It's the case studies. It's the anecdotes. It's the stories that won me over when uh, we created the Financial Planner of the Year Award and Money Management in the early, the mid '90s, and I changed up the protocol for that or the judging criteria. So it wasn't just a popularity contest. It, it we had to um, we asked advisors to send in client testimonials, actual written. So what we got was incredible <laughs> in the in the mid '90s. So it was um, we got birthday cards that were sent from clients. We got letters that were written long, long handwritten tomes of wonderful examples of uh, proving the quality of the advice and you know what happened when um, I had an accident and then we had to lodge a claim on the insurance and how the advisor you know turned up at my house and sat down at the kitchen table and we worked through it and then we, we worked out what we we're going to do with all the money and I owe all of my, you know, my current good good uh, fortune to the um, the role that this person played in my life. Yeah. So uh, it's really powerful. So, it, it you know, people will buy from people, people will trust people um, and I think that if you show them, not tell them, then, you know, you, you're doing a, a really good job to um, – uh, to get that efficacy in your communication, to to really show that you mean business. Hmm. So, yeah. so we're we're recording this this episode the you know, the day after the quality of advice kind of reforms and, and kind of yeah. response, whatever you want to call it, it's just been just been announced. Yeah. You know, are we at a point, or you know, will we ever be at a point where where financial advice is is kind of regarded as a profession in the vein of? Accountants and doctors and, and and those kind of things and, and yeah. those, those announcements in the last twenty four hours help or hinder that? Yeah, it's uh, it's an excellent question. And James, I've asked myself this question uh, in consecutive decades since the nineteen nineties. <laughs> so let me let me phrase it this way. And and if if just indulge me for a minute as I walk back a bit and uh, let's go back to ninety two, right, with um, the SG and Keating and the birth of uh, financial planning through that that process. That was a Labor government that brought that that uh, policy in. We now have another Labor government. So fast forward some thirty one years, uh, and yet another review on top of another review on top of another review on ad nauseum on the financial services sector and in particular the advice um, the advice sector. So the quality of advice review was supposedly about uh, providing greater access and affordability to all Australians to uh, what has become a very rare commodity, which is quality financial advice due to the lack of um, you know, numbers of, uh, of advisors. We have yeah. uh, too few trying to serve a lot of people. But it's, it's curious to me that um, you know, essentially the, the same um, – system of SG that launched financial planning also launched the industry funds and the power, the great power that the superannuation sector now wields 
in terms of its four trillion dollars and growing mm. by mandated growth. Um, it's a, it's a, an extraordinary legacy for for Keating, but it also means that um, the minister or the assistant treasurer, when he announced this week the findings of his year long review of um, the Levy document. He chose to sit down with a bunch of executives from the superannuation industry to give them a heads up first go at what he was planning. So, you know, it's um, this is all this is all political in a sense, but it's got kind of an, an, an interesting uh, um, cycle to it, doesn't it? It's a thirty year cycle of um, of incredible growth. But what does it mean for advisors? I think those that have survived and those that are attracted to this sector have probably in my career, it's the first genuine real go at creating that quality, professional, uh, client-focused um, profession that, that has, has long been uh, you know, sought by the, by the financial planners that, um, that I respect, uh, some of whom have now retired in frustration, but those that I respect and, and who persevere, are, you know, they're on the cusp of something really great. But we can't do it in terms of lifting the, the heavy task of getting more quality advice into more Australians' hands without the, um, without the superannuation funds and that sort of limited advice model that has been uh, proposed. Yeah. And it's, as, a, as a kind of a, a communication expert, it's interesting to pick your brain on you know, the, the forum in which they, that that was that was announced you know, do, yeah. clearly that was done on purpose but but you know do, you, do what do you think it means by by you know having it launched in a particular forum like it was so having having worked on the inside of the financial planning association during the the 2012 13 period when another labor government was in power and it was a a young uh, chris bowen who um, introduced the the FOFA reforms, which brought in legislative fiduciary duty, uh, the best interest test, and uh, and that um, that future of financial advice um, was meant to be at that time the be all and end all in, in the corpse law of how to uh, regulate the industry, and um, it was all. And, and I remind people as well that that was then about access and affordability. Yeah. That was the government's spin on on what that reform was 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 about, but. Um, Proudly for me, I was on the inside with the with the FPA, who was a client of mine at the time, and worked with then chair and the the um, and the leadership group on um, making sure that the ban on conflicted remuneration was legislated and making sure that that it stuck because it was a it was an important barrier that was preventing decent quality professional advice and a profession to finally emerge. Yeah. So I think um, you know we've now got to your question about the the choice of the of the uh, strategy to roll out the the much anticipated um, release of the quality of advice review. I think it was partly a slap in the face to those people who had done all the heavy lifting yeah. on um, from the from the industry point of view, from the advice industry point of view, from the advice profession point of view, um, and to choose to um, enlist or you know pre-brief uh, the superannuation funds, the industry funds. Yeah, I, I, I took that as, uh, a, as, a bit of, um, as a bit of a slap in the face, certainly to the existing professional bodies, so the, the FAAA and also to the Financial Services Council, which are, represents the product manufacturers, who also have a stake in this in some ways. But look, they did, they did manage to pre-brief our mate Alex Vikovic at the AFR, so he got the scoop. He got the scoop. So they, you know, it's a, it's a, this is all the politics and the and the strategizing that um, that I understand how that works. But um, uh, I note I note that there's been a pretty heavy media schedule that Stephen Jones has been on the the talking circuit, talking up why there's some five million Australians about to retire who need advice, yeah. but can't afford it. The best way to do it is through the fiduciary, you know, uh, framework of their superannuation fund, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no discussion about really um, that core issue of um, how do we avoid repeating the mistakes of the past where we allow um, 
you know, limited advice models to basically become uh, wholesale distribution mechanisms to rip people off. Because I'll remind people again that, you know, that, that Chris Bowen um, uh, FOFA scenario, that only came about because in 2009, uh, we're at the we're at the aftermath of, of Storm Financial that collapse and also Opus Prime another major collapse and you know these legislative reactions uh, follow those uh, enormous uh, you know those enormous kind of heartbreaking stories that happen when you have the wrong people doing the wrong thing yeah. with other people's money <laughs> and you bring, so <laughs> you bring a you bring a really interesting conversation to the table in that you you know you you do some work with some with with financial advisors and financial advice businesses around you know their communication and so forth but then you've got this bit of history of being you know on the inside with the fpa or you know whoever else it, that it might be so it's an interesting perspective that you can bring to it and then yes it, it's actually i know cool. it's, it's un- i think it's uh, thank you james i think it's quite unique but um you know there was some other organizations that I've also worked on the inside of, for example, the formation of the AFCA, the Financial Complaints Authority, which which came out of um, what what used to be called FOS, the Financial Ombudsman Service. So when it when it formulated, uh, we were asked to help uh, communicate it and to work with uh, the new CEO and the board at that time. And and sort of um, now that that happened just just on the eve of. Uh, the Hain Royal Commission. So we also got dragged into uh, into the Hain Royal Commission on the basis that much of the evidence that was brought before Hain and in that came through that commission uh, was sourced through the AFCA case file. So there was a lot of uh, crossover there in terms of um, you know evidence to support um, the. Um, uh, prosecution of wrongdoing by some of the larger institutions. So we're now seeing as a result of that, those same institutions have exited the advice space. They've, yeah. they've, 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 they've sold up and moved on. And, uh, you know, back in the day, then I was preparing witnesses uh, for that. If you remember the, the, the Hain, the, the Royal Commission process, it was, uh, and, and talking about reputation, it was, it was really, um, you know, you had a, a single camera on the witness in the stand uh, being grilled by by the lawyers and uh, over certain events that, that they had to recall over some years. And um, there's there was no real uh, opportunity for giving contextual background to any of those events so that the people were really um, – uh, it, it was a perception medium of the highest order. And you were guilty unless proven otherwise. <laughs> so really difficult times, but look, that's that's a moment, another sort of footnote in history, but a very important one, really. And um, and the thing the thing I'm trying to lead up to is that all of these things matter. All of this history matters in the minds, particularly of those five million Australians that are those boomers that are about to retire. That um, uh, the minister Minister Jones, the assistant treasurer, talks about. You know they'll have memory of that stuff. They'll have memory of these issues, and and uh, it's an important part of this discussion. I think James is trust. You know how do we how do we install trust in the minds of that that cohort of people, or do we or do we just uh, look to the younger cohort of people who who also need help and uh, you know the next generations? I think that's a, another incredibly important part of the puzzle here. I guess it kind of circles back to what we we're saying at the start around kind of advisor or advice reputation that these kind of building blocks of the story that you know, these five million people that are going to be heading into retirement that you know, we're all supposed to try and help in one way, shape, or form. Yeah, they've got some story of you know what they've been reading in the in the press and wherever else, and they'll form an opinion before they are. Uh, they will, but they'll also be guided by their immediate um, social group and. You know, if, 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 if we were talking about advice as an organization, um, as a corporate reputation, say, then we know that there are certain levers or factors, really, coefficients like that help determine corporate reputation. So, you know, it's things like your social responsibility, 
It's um, the profitability of your of your organization to a certain point. So think about the bank's half yearly results, record profits. So billions of dollars in record profits. That's a good thing if you're a shareholder, but a not so good thing if you're a mortgage holder under pain of increasing cash rates. And so there's a there's a dilemma there, right? They, they need there's a corporate reputation issue. So those two parts, it's like a balancing act. So they would look at that and go, well, we now need to dial up other parts of our reputation. So we'll start to increase the communication in the market around our social responsibility. So I don't know, if you're a Westpac, you might start running ads on the rescue helicopter that you sponsor that saves yeah. lives, or you might um, look at other aspects of how you, you, you develop community relations or how you're giving back. Um, and that is all designed to offset, um, you know, the the downside or negative impacts of, of, of cr- having too much profit. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's a constant dynamic. And, and this is the, this is the sort of, uh, it, it sounds quite cynical, doesn't it? When you think about it in, in that you're actually managing it from this point of view, it's yep. not, but you must manage it. And that's, that's the message to, anyone in business really that you, you really should understand um, what constitutes reputation and, and how to manage it and because reputation at its heart is what what others think about you and what others say about you yeah. when you're not in the room and, you know and that's that's incredibly important particularly as I said as we've got um, you know this uh, this this massive opportunity ahead for financial advice in Australia yeah now you've you've just launched on you know kind of fill me in on it some like a, a immediate training of some variety like what what is that what is it what is it and what's going on what's what's the plans so our message uh, so media training really is um again we do a lot we're actually in the middle of a, a, a major round of, of of helping a a top 10 asx company who's just integrated another large business into its fold. So um, the idea there is that they need um, they need those people to be able to essentially communicate off the same consistent hymn sheet. And um, I had a guy actually last week turn up and say, very senior guy, you know, similar age to myself, 30 years in business. Well, I'm not here to be turned into some, you know, puppet and I <laughs> some with with a marketing you know a marketing message and and that's not that's not what I'm going to say well that's great cuz I'm not here to turn you into a puppet and that's not what we do so it, it is actually more about understanding how to connect with others and remain authentic in in the in that process but also more than that to be much more clear and articulate on how messages are formulated and what happens when you're communicating to another human being, what they are doing in processing that information and, and how uh, you need to understand what's going on in their minds to um, resolve some questions that will naturally occur when you um, start to um, try to convince them of the merit of your of your thesis or of your position or of your advice. So, yeah. and that's essentially it. So, media training is really a construct for us to talk about message delivery and uh, effective communication. And um, and there's something specific in that space you're doing with with female advisors. Is that is that you're doing something along those lines? Yeah. So recently, um, absolutely. So mm-hmm. there's a big issue in representation. Uh, well, there's a female uh, representation issue, it's full stop, but there's a, a symbolically more um, uh, challenging issue in that the media um, has a very low representation of females when it comes to finance, when it comes to um, the superannuation sector that we've been talking about today. And um, it's it's something like sub 20%. And it's projected over the next 10 years to get to maybe 34% in terms of, you know, versus versus male representation as, as a voice. Now, as a PR firm, we, we have daily interactions with media and uh, they're crying out. They're saying, who, who have you got that's a woman that we can 
profile. And uh, uh, I'm keen and have been for some time to help correct that balance, but also to um, work with organizations that have great women. And I know there's um, a, a lot of organizations who, who are seeking to promote um, on merit the, the women who are making a, a really you know, enduring uh, contribution to the industry and to their own careers and, and juggling so many facets of their family lives and, and their professional lives. So I, I together together with uh, Vanessa Stoikov, who's an old friend of mine who runs uh, a, a, a media content business, um, we've, we've pulled together a program to help uh, empower more women and have them prepared to do um, and train them and have them set up well to do media. And, uh, you know, uh, to, to talk about if they're a financial advisor, to talk about what they do and how they impact others. Uh, if they're working in the product side of the industry, to talk about the technical aspects of it or in superannuation, to talk about, you know, uh, the role that, that, um, that, that, that money can, can, uh, play positively in the lives of others, not necessarily just women, but women, uh, generally have, um, uh, you know, uh, more challenges in terms of equity in pay, but also in uh, time off uh, for families and, uh, and you know, starting families, becoming mums and returning to the workforce. Uh, now, that's not to say that <clears throat> we're taking a, a traditionalist view. It's just the pragmatics and the reality of, yeah. of society. Yeah. Well, Bruce, thank you for joining me today. Um, if anyone wants to reach out to you, find out a little bit more about what you do, you know, this, you know, this skills builder thing that you've just been mentioning uh, about trying to build the uh, build some profiles. Uh, where can where can people find you? We'll put some links into the show notes. But for anyone that's listening, where can people? Oh, find wonderful! You? Well, they can they can reach out to us at um, madden.com.au. Yep. Just on the website. Uh, yeah, I could give you all my socials, but. Uh, I can't think of them off the top of my head, but <laughs> we'll put some links into wherever people might be picking this up from one of the podcast platforms or wherever Thank else. Thank you, James. We'll put some. Yeah. We'll get some links from you and put them in there. Wonderful, Bruce. Pleasure to have a have a chat with you. Thank you for joining me. I'm sure there's a fair bit of value in that in this conversation for lots of people. Thank I you. Hope so it's been great to talk talk to you as well. I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>